Amazing stories of someone who had morals. Spoke gently, lifting compassion banners. Never vacillated to say what's right. His conviction in Islam was eternally bright. Was eternally bright. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد My dear and respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته And welcome to this new episode from our series The Amazing Stories from the Quran and from the prophetic tradition of the Prophet Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام A new episode today inshallah تعالى with a new story and a very interesting and a very exciting story. Probably you have already read this story before in a hadith, in a book. However, I promise you inshallah ta'ala that after we complete this very long story, you will look at it in the future inshallah ta'ala from a very different perspective, a much wider perspective and see how rich it is and how full of benefits it is and how full of gems and so many gems that we can learn from it, and so many lessons that we can benefit, inshallah ta'ala. It is a story that is full of mercy. A story of mercy. And by the way, we have not mentioned that in our previous episode, in our introduction, but you will see, subhanallah, when preparing this show, and the different stories that I was going through, you will see, subhanallah, that if there was one word to describe one common word, to describe a common area in all these stories that the Prophet ﷺ has told us about, it would be the mode or the word mercy. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That verily we have only sent you, Muhammad wasalam, as a mercy to the universe, and all, not only to mankind, as some people actually translate the verse, is to the universe. And you will see it, inshallah ta'ala, in this story, and in every single story that will come after that. You will see how much mercy is offered in the message of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. It is a story of repentance, of somebody who wanted to change the direction of his life. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, tells us, and this is a narration, that was reported by Bukhari and Muslim, and to make it more interesting, inshallah ta'ala, and more beneficial for us, I have tried to mix together the actual narration of Bukhari with the actual narration of Muslim, and take the wording, the best of the wording from this narration and from this narration, inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, كَانَ فِي مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ There was... In one of the nations that came before you, one of the ages before you, so, see subhanAllah how the Prophet ﷺ is telling us about the story that happened before us. And this reminds us of the fact that Islam is a universal religion as we believe as Muslims, that Islam is the religion of all the prophets and the messengers. And it is an extension. The message of Muhammad ﷺ is only an extension of the message that started from the other prophets and messengers before him, with the first prophet Adam alayhi salam, and the first messenger Nuh, Noe alayhi salatu was salam. So all these messengers and all these prophets, and all the believers that followed them, they were actually Muslims, they are our brothers in Islam. They were following the same path as ours. Why? Because all the path of the prophets and the messengers is a very simple path. It is only the message of submit not and submit to no one except to the one who created us, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God, the Almighty. This is the common message. And then after that comes the details of every single legislation. So the Prophet ﷺ is reminding us here that we have to remember our brothers and sisters who came and who lived before us a thousand years before the Prophet ﷺ, 2,000 years, 5,000 years, and so on. He said, ﷺ, كَانَ فِي مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ And in another narration, 
كان في بني إسرائيل رجل that there was in بني إسرائيل in the nation of the son of Israel there was a man and why as we will notice inshallah ta'ala there are so many stories that talk to us about بني إسرائيل that happened in the time of the nation of Israel the son of Israel the sons of Israel why because as the scholars have mentioned as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to Bani Israel to this nation so many prophets and so many messengers so many that so many stories happened with all the believers that were with them because it is an issue of statistics they had much more time to spend with the prophets and the messengers so obviously there would be much more narrations and stories that happened and that the Prophet ﷺ is talking to us about. What happened to this man? He has killed and he has assassinated 99 souls. 99 souls. Imagine how big of a criminal this man was at that time. Of that initial situation, my dear brothers and sisters. Imagine, just imagine, if this man was your neighbor, for example, as well, or was another Muslim that you know, that he has committed not only the crime of killing a person, which is a great and a huge crime, as we know, one of the most major sins is to kill someone with injustice. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, or as the Prophet والسلام, told us in the hadith, لا يزال المؤمن في فسحة من دينه that the believer is still in so much space, so much air, so much basically room for mercy, for forgiveness in his religion ما لم يصب دما حراما as long as he does not touch an unlawful blood unjustly as long as he does not hurt another person and make their blood come out, make their soul come out, because the soul is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not have the right to go to a person unjustly, just like that, and take their life away from them. So imagine this person, not only they committed this crime once, they did it 99 times, a time after a time after a time, a hundred times minus one. And in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ told us, insanan, he killed 99 human beings, not only souls. It was not only animals, although it is so dangerous to unjustly kill an animal. But he actually killed human beings, which is much, much, much more dangerous. As we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the nafs, to the soul, to the human soul, so much importance, so much protection. We cannot touch it just like that. To the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listened to this very dangerous verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَنَّهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا That the example of the one who unjustly kills another person is like the example. It is as if he had killed all of the human beings. As if he had killed everyone. Why? The scholars, they have mentioned behind this example, this analogy, that the reason behind it is that usually when one person kills, another person will take their example and they will start killing. And then the third person, and then the fourth person. And then there will be so much crimes and so much serial killers in the society that people won't have security anymore. And the first person will be responsible for that because they had initiated this path for this huge crime. The Prophet ﷺ said, Then this man came out of this house to ask. And in another narration, فَسَأَلَ عَنْ أَعْلَمِ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ He told people, direct me to the most knowledgeable scholar on this earth. Look how determined he is, how serious he is about his question. What would be his question? Of course, his question would be that he regrets what he is doing. He does not like the situation in which he is, so he wants to find a solution. And he is not looking for someone who is going to tell him that what you are doing is wrong because it is just obvious that it is wrong. 
but he is looking for a helping hand, for someone who will help him be out of this situation, of this very dirty situation, of being a criminal, someone who will help him change the direction of his life and become a better person to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we know, the Muslim, the believer, has the obligation to learn about the religion. Please, my dear brothers and sisters, give so much importance to this element that we will be mentioning again and again in this story and other stories, inshallah ta'ala. The importance of knowledge. Knowledge is part of faith. It is part of Islam. A Muslim can never, ever, it is only impossible to be a good believer, a good Muslim, if we are ignorant about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't work. We have to seek knowledge. We have to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by seeking more knowledge. Who do we ask? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to ask. Who do we ask? We ask the people of knowledge. The scholars that we call in Arabic, the ulama. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask. This is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an order. Meaning we have to obey it. We have no choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فَاسْأَلُوا Then ask the people of knowledge, the people of the book, the ones who know the Qur'an, who know Islam by heart. Ask them. If you do not know, whenever we do not have the knowledge in an issue that's related to Islam, what do we do? Do we invent an information? No. Do we go on the internet, on one of the search tools to be able to find an answer to us, to our question, to be able to find an answer on a blog, for example, that we do not know who is writing? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ Ask the scholars, those who have the knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their advice, their answer, their directives are very important to us more than any other directives. This is why actually in many situations, we should ask the scholars of Islam, the scholars of the religion, before asking any other scholar in any other specialization and any other field of science. Although it is important to benefit from the experts as we will see inshallah ta'ala. Yes, we have to benefit from our experts of course. However, very important to understand that the priority lies with the scholars of Islam, the scholars of the religion. And then after that, we learn from the rest of the scholars in their own fields of specialization and expertise. Inshallah ta'ala, stay with us. We will take so much more and extract so many other lessons and gems from this part of the story, inshallah ta'ala. Right after the break, we'll see you in a short moment, inshallah ta'ala. This conviction in Islam was eternally bright, was eternally bright. Our schools, what is missing? Join Dr. Mamdour Muhammad in Our Schools, What is Missing? He will be discussing the most common mistakes made in our educational systems. What type of teaching they teach him, what they say to him, what books they select for him to read, what things that he listens to, what games that he begins to play with. How to perfect uh, the, the work in the school. Our goal is to improve our school. And we'll see practical solutions from the book of Allah and the Sunnah of his messenger. Most of the criteria uh, for success for us had been designed for us by our Creator. Our schools, what is missing in Ramadan on Hoda TV? Conviction in Islam was eternally bright was eternally bright. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, welcome back to our episode still with the story of the man who killed 99 souls. And we mentioned that this man actually came out of his house and he wanted to ask a question. So he said, as we have in the hadith of the Prophet 
فسأل عن أعلم أهل الأرض. He told people to direct him to the most knowledgeable scholar on this earth. We have said how important it is for us as Muslims to benefit from our scholars, to ask them questions, to refer to them, because they are the inheritance, the heirs of the prophets. Warathatul Anbiya, as the Prophet ﷺ has told us. And this, please do not get me wrong, it has to be very clear, inshallah ta'ala. It does not mean that the rest of the scholars and the scientists are not important in Islam. No, not at all. Every expert and every person of science, of beneficial science, has a very big and huge importance of Islam. However, they should not have their say over the say of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the say and the statement and the position of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is known through the opinion of the scholars. So we are not saying here that if you are having some pain in your stomach, you are going to a mufti, to a scholar of Islam, to ask him to tell you what to do. No, you go to a doctor. However, when it is something that's related, especially to the nafs, meaning to the soul, to the personality, the priority has to be given to the scholars of Islam, above and before any other form of thinker or scientist or anything like this. And this is why here, he wanted to find the problem to his soul and the solution to that problem. So he was looking for a scholar of religion that knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that knowledge can be taken from that scholar through questions, through asking questions. We have to learn, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to learn. We have to take this as a habit, as part of our life, that whenever something is not clear, we take it as a reaction automatically to go look for a scholar that we trust and we ask him the question to be able to get the answer and after that to be cured. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ has told us as in Sunan Abi Dawood, he said ﷺ, إِنَّمَا شِفَاءُ الْعِيِّ That verily the cure and the main cure for ignorance is why is what exactly? Is to ask questions. Meaning if we are ignorant, we want to have knowledge, what do we do? We go to the scholars, we ask them, they give us the answer. After that, if the scholar is a trustworthy scholar, we did our best, whether they give the right answer or the wrong answer, we are forgiven on the Day of Judgment. We are not responsible. It is the scholar who has the responsibility on the Day of Judgment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the one who does not ask question, as for the one who makes up answers in his religion, my dear brothers and sisters, this is very dangerous. Because first of all, he is disobeying the Prophet ﷺ. He is failing in one of the main obligations of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, as in Ibn Majah, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ Seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every believer. It does not mean that every Muslim has to be a scholar of Islam. And to know everything about Islam. No. But as the scholars have mentioned, it means that for every person, they have to know that which is relevant to their life. So let's say, for example, I'm a businessman. I do business, for example. If that was the case, then I would have the obligation before starting doing business to learn about the rulings of transactions in Islam. The rulings of finances in Islam. If I'm a rich person, I have to know about the rulings of zakat, charity, the obligatory charity, the third pillar of Islam, and so on. I have to pray, I have to learn how to pray before starting praying. And this is why it's just amazing sometimes how when it comes to the religion, we completely twist the logical rules. We see that many people, they want to pray, they start praying right away. And they don't know that their prayer may be not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're not praying the proper way. I might have a very nice and a very beautiful excitement for becoming a doctor, but my excitement by itself is not enough. I cannot go and just open a clinic by myself and write, I am a doctor, come to me. I'll be taken to the court and maybe even to jail. Why? Because they will ask me the question, did you actually study medicine first before practicing it? I will say no. 
they will say, how can that make any sense? If you really want to become a doctor, go and study as the doctors they do. You will go through many years in university and practice and everything before actually going into the working side of it. Same thing for Islam. Before starting to do our prayer or any other action, we have to seek the knowledge. Now, let's look at how serious this man was in changing his life and seeking the proper knowledge. Subhanallah, listen my dear brothers and sisters. He did not only want a scholar, he is asking to be directed to the most knowledgeable scholar, not in his town, not in his country, but in the whole world, subhanAllah, what a high aspiration can that be? That he does not want an answer except from the best scholar that he can get. From the best scholar that he can get. Although he did not have to do that. Meaning that for a Muslim, when we want to know the answer to a question, it does not mean that we will go, for example, to the most knowledgeable person on earth and leave on the side of the other scholars. No. Any scholar that's qualified is enough for us to go to and to ask to be able to get the proper question. Now, very important here, I wanted to share with you uh, some very important and very beneficial gems, inshallah ta'ala. Many people are confused concerning this issue. They say, who do we ask? I do not know who the scholars are. I do not know who to trust. So how can I choose my scholar? The big and the big imams and the first scholars of Islam, they have mentioned that there are two criteria for us to know who is qualified to answer and who is not qualified to answer. First of all, the person that we have to seek fatwa or seek an answer from has to have knowledge, of course, has to be knowledgeable about the religion. And second, the second condition for that is that they have to be a trustworthy person. Meaning a pious person, a pious believer, a practicing believer as we call it nowadays. Now someone can ask again, how can I know? And the answer is, for the second condition, listen to this, write it down, memorize it. For the second condition, when it comes to the actual aspect of trust, worthy person, the actual aspect of a pious person, by default, the rule by default is that Every Muslim is a, practice, a practicing Muslim. Every Muslim is a pious Muslim. We think good of any Muslim. If I meet a Muslim for the first time, I have to think the best about him. As long as I did not see something different than that. But if I see the same person after that, drinking alcohol openly for example, or stealing and acting as a thief openly next to my eyes, then at that moment I will say that this Muslim is not a good Muslim, is not a trustworthy Muslim. I cannot rely on this person no matter how much knowledge they might have about the religion. I cannot take them between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to learning about the religion. So the default rule is that every Muslim is trustworthy until proven that it is actually not the side. And this is subhanAllah, look how Islam is beautiful, that Islam has two aspects. We have the internal aspect and we have the external aspect. When it comes to the external aspect, this is what we have to be worried about. Meaning we take people for granted according to what we see from them. If I see someone praying and I see them acting as a good person with their behavior, I do not see anything wrong with them. Of course, we're not talking here about minor sins because everybody has sins. We can all make a minor sin in front of people. None of us is an actual perfect angel. But we are talking here about major sins. If someone, as we have said, if you see someone drinking alcohol openly, that there is no doubt that we, we are going to say that this is a practicing Muslim. They are not because they disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala openly with a major sin. But at the same time, we have to not look at the internal side of the person. Meaning this is not, it's none of our business what the person is doing when they are inside their house, inside the room, when they close up their doors. This is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> it is not part of our responsibility to go and to check 
what is in the hearts of the people. And the second condition, my dear brothers and sisters, is to be able to prove that this person that we are referring to as a scholar has the necessary knowledge. They are specialized in the knowledge of Islam. They have acquired the necessary knowledge that allows them to answer us. So a Muslim can be a very practicing Muslim, but they do not have the knowledge. We cannot refer to them. We cannot take them as a reference to get our answers about Islam. Now a person again can ask, how can I know who is knowledgeable and who is not knowledgeable? And there are many ways for knowing that as the scholars of Islam has uh, or have mentioned. For example, one of them is the actual fame, the popularity, how famous they are. Some scholars, they are famous that they are scholars. We do not have to ask questions again because everybody knows that he is a scholar. He is known to be a scholar. So we do not have to go through the actual knowledge check that we will do in a regular situation. Another thing would be the witnessing of the scholars. If someone that is known to be a huge and a major and a respected scholar will tell you this person this one of my students is qualified to teach, is qualified to answer questions, and so on. Then, this is a testimony from a trustworthy scholar that we can refer to the other scholar. The same thing can be also applied to someone who is writing books about Islam. He is writing fatawa, giving fatwas openly in the masajid and everything, under the sight and the knowledge of the qualified scholars, and they have never said anything. They have never opposed the fact that he is teaching or answering or anything like that. This is also one of the ways that will tell us indirectly that this person is actually qualified to answer us about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's say and let's see what happened to this person after that when he asked to be directed to another or to the most knowledgeable scholar on earth but to answer that inshallah ta'ala and to continue with this amazing hadith we will meet you inshallah ta'ala at our next or in our next episode inshallah be with us jazakumullahu khayran subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh I love the prophet who struggled so hard When his mission was just a start He held the hands of each companion I'm ashamed to play with little children With little children Amazing stories of someone who had morals Spoke gently, lifting compassion banners Never vacillated to say what's right His conviction in Islam was eternally bright Was eternally bright